not sure what you all know about Kentucky. Um, in fact, after reading this book, just the uh, prologue of this book, I'm not sure how much I know. Uh, I got this book called The Bluegrass Conspiracy. It's uh, by Sally Ditton. And it was, uh, it starts at September 11th, 1985. So Kentucky's had their own September 11th, 1985. Okay, in 1985, September 11th in Kentucky, uh, there was a, uh, a, an incident, an incident that had happened. So, the Bluegrass Conspiracy, an inside story of power, greed, drugs, and murder by Sally Ditton, Doubleday Press, New York. And it's copywritten in 1990. So, it's, uh, there's a situation in Kentucky, the Bluegrass Conspiracy. So, copyright 1990s, five years after it had happened. The prologue, midnight, September 11th, 1985. The red lights of the <coughs> the red lights of the instrument panel glared in the pitch black airplane cockpit. The pilot, 40-year-old Andrew Carter Thornton II, Andrew Carton Carter Thornton II, had rehearsed the steps a thousand times in his mind plotted his strategy with the precision of a commando for the event he hoped would never happen. When he realized that two jets were on his tail, Drew knew that such specialized chase aircraft could only have been deployed by U.S. Customs. It was not in his nature to admit fear, but he wasn't optimistic about the, the forced switch on his contingency plan. Moments earlier, the cold night air had blasted into the plane as Drew, uh, which is Andrew Carter Thornton II, Andrew Carter Thornton II and his partner opened the door of the Cessna 404 and kicked the last parachute load into a remote, remote section of Georgia Forest. So they're flying over Georgia. So it didn't happen in Kentucky, it happened in Georgia. But it's a Kentucky man. Then they prepared themselves for a jump into the black sky. Drew packed his army duffel bag with a Browning 9mm automatic pistol, a 22 caliber pistol, several clips of ammunition, a stiletto, $4,500 in cash, six Grungerands, grunger Grungerand, which I'm not sure what a Grungerand is, but six Grungerands, food rations and vitamins, a compass, an altimeter, and an identification papers in two different names. This time his enemies on the ground were not the Viet Cong or the Sandinistas out of Nicaragua, which was a democratic group, and the Viet Cong who was also fighting for their independence and freedom, and estimated... Two to four million Vietnamese died in the Vietnam War. So America uh, had plenty of, of their own Holocaust. One million dead in Iraq, 100 million uh, dead in Native American Holocaust. So uh, America knows about wiping out millions of people. So this time his enemies on the ground weren't the Viet Cong or the Sandinistas, but it was the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agents. Wearing a bulletproof vest and military issue infrared night vision goggles, he checked the straps to his parachute. The inspection was perfunctory, as Drew's paranoia of sabotage was so great that he did not allow anyone to touch his chute. The distant lights of Knoxville, Tennessee twinkled on the horizon below. As he set the plane on automatic pilot, directed the aircraft to its crash destination in the remote mountains of North Carolina, and slid an extra ignition key into his pants pocket. His load, although heavy, was precisely the weight he had thought that his parachute could handle. Not an ounce more, not an ounce less. Drew opened the door and jumped into the vast night, a free-falling flight as symbolic as America's spin from the 1950s into the 1980s. So, the prosperity of the 1960s into the abysmal uh, class war starting Ronald Reagan, murderous. Okay. Fred Myers always arose at 5.15 a.m. His routine, from which he rarely deviated, included reading the Knoxville Journal while awaiting a breakfast call from his two sisters. Both in their 90s, who lived down the road in this autumn, early autumn morning, the 85-year-old retired engineer and guitar picker gazed out of his bathroom window while shaving. Across the apple orchard, in the dawn light, he saw a dead body in the driveway. He telephoned his elderly sisters. <laughs> so across the apple orchard, in the dawn light, he saw a dead body in his driveway. Fred Myers wakes up 5.15 in the morning. He telephoned his elderly sisters, and he described the strange sight. Fred Myers had always had an active imagination, and his sisters knew it. 
Uh, they told him to go back to bed. Instead, Myers, Fred Myers called the police. The crumpled heap, the crumpled heap in Myers' gravel driveway was Drew Thornton, a notorious narcotics agent turned drug smuggler. So, Andrew Thornton, Andrew Carter Thornton II, used to be a drug agent, and then he, I guess he flipped. He got inside the game too much, and he stayed, so uh, he's, he's not like Serpico, right? He's not like, a, I don't know. He's um, he's kind of like a Johnny Depp in that one movie with uh, Pacino. He got in and he couldn't tell, you know, what was real. Am I supposed to be loyal to my newfound friends or back um, at the people at the division, at the DEA? I think it's the DEA. I'm not sure for sure. It just said narcotics agent. Okay, so I saw the pack on him and I knew right then that he had too big a load for that little old parachute. Myers later told the news reporters who swarmed onto his property. When Knoxville police opened the three-and-a-half long uh, duffel bag tied around Drew's waist, they discovered 34 football-sized bundles of cocaine. 34 football-sized <laughs> bundles of cocaine. Another bag tied to his body held dehydrated food and other survival supplies. His main parachute was still in its pack. His right hand was still gripped had still gripped the ripcord of his partially deployed reserve chute. He was wearing combat-style fatigues and expensive Italian shoes, a seeming non-sequitur to those getting their first glimpse into the bizarre world of the sexy, madcap Kentucky blue blood. So Andrew Thornton Carter II. Andrew Carter Thornton. Andrew Carter Thornton II. This is a madcap blue, uh, Kentucky blue blood. His pockets contained a membership card to the Miami, Miami Jockey Club and a personal address book listing fewer than a dozen names and telephone numbers. Bruises and abrasions marked both legs and a trickle of blood had hardened on both cheeks. His spine and several ribs were fractured. A ruptured aorta had killed him. So he died of a heart attack. He pulled the zip cord and didn't uh, knew that he was going to die. And so he had, uh, he had died of a, a heart attack. Uh, I'm sure the, the, the impact... Uh, would have killed him anyways, but uh, he had a heart attack before the impact. The impact had any any impact. So, of the three epigrams he carried in his pocket, the most revealing read: "There's only one tactical principle not subject to change. It is to inflict the maximum amount of wounds, death, and destruction on the enemy in the minimum amount of time." Journalists and cops in Tennessee scratched their heads in bewilderment. bewilderment. They couldn't untangle the incongruities of the handsome man who had plunged to his death with $75 million worth of pure cocaine strapped to his waist and a failed parachute on his back. But back home in Kentucky, Drew's wild and crashing demise seemed a logical c conclusion to his life on the edge. Over the past 20 years, Drew had bounced from job to job, avocation from avocation. After a brief stint as an Army paratrooper, he dabbled in racehorse breeding, undercover police work, and martial arts. He became a pilot, he collected guns, and he struggled through law school at night, obtaining a degree but very few clients. He drove a white Jaguar sports car, and he played polo with other well-bred boyhood friends. He was an L.L. Bean-type dresser, sporting elegant flannels and expensive outdoor clothing, a health food fanatic and fitness freak. Drew smuggled tons of pot and cocaine into the country while claiming never to touch the stuff. And as a kid, he wasn't athletic, he wasn't a good student, and he wasn't popular. As a cop, he was a bully who enjoyed beating up kids that he busted, roughing up the drunks and hookers who put up a little resistance. And he practiced his karate on drugs. So Andrew Carter Thornton, Andrew Carter Thornton, ACT, <laughs> ACT, Andrew Carter Thornton the second. He was a bully. He was a psychopathic bully. He liked to beat up pets and dogs karate practice karate on dogs he would bully kids as a police officer he would rough up the drunks and the and the hookers so he was not a good guy he was not a good guy and it sounds like he's a wild man he believed in power through intimidation and he thought that he possessed supernatural abilities and somehow persuaded an unlikely crew of misfits and sycophants from Lexington's seamier side of the tracks to become his fiercely loyal groupies so sycophants, he was able to get some people who were uh, kissing his butt so much, I guess from the division, from the agency, uh, uh, and went from 
what they say, it went from a no notorious narcotics agent into a drug smuggler. At Andrew Carter Thornton, 1985. Andrew Carter Thornton. Okay, so, he, uh, Andrew Carter Thornton II boasted of military decorations and courageous daring do, hinting at ties to the CIA and dangerous escapades as a soldier and a mercenary. But his army records described him as an unremarkable 5 foot 8 inch 150 pound private who received basic training, spent two months in combat in the Dominican Republic, during which time he had shot in the left arm and received medals for having been wounded in action, who was exemplary in neither aptitude nor performance, and who was a disciplinary uh, problem on at least one occasion. The picture of Drew's dead body appeared on all three networks and went across the country's major news wires. Published photos from the happier times showed a man in his prime, a tanned and fit man of action, handsome and flashy enough to be a star on Miami Vice. Drew Thornton wanted to be known as a guy with guts. He wanted people to think that he was tough and intelligent, cunning and sophisticated. His exploits would have been dismissed as those of a second-class outlaw had he had not been the son of what is known in the South as a good family. And he possessed the political and social connections inherent to such landed gentry. To the average newspaper reader, Drew's bizarre death was just another twisted statistic in the much ballyhooed war on drugs. But Ralph Edward Ross knew that there was more. Ross knew that Drew Thornton was a gun runner whose tentacles extended into the highest levels of state government, national law enforcement, and top secret military installations. Ralph Edward Ross, he knew more, okay, about Drew Thornton. About the insane man, the insane Drew Thornton. So, uh, he, his network, uh, top silly secret military installations, and that his network, uh, Drew Thornton's network, include assassinate, assassins, mercenaries, governors, and federal drug agents. And his lieutenants and his allies have penetrated the inner sanctums of at least two Kentucky governors, John Y. Brown Jr. and Julian Carroll. So... Uh, they had penetrated the inner sanctum, so they was able to get inside the inner circles of the top officials in Kentucky government. Both John Y. Brown Jr., which I think owns the Yum Center now, so he's, he owns KFC and a lot of corporations, which is interesting. You become governor, and then you own all these corporations right afterwards, so uh, I wonder if they're uh, in bed with each other. And then you got Julian Carroll, who is known as the, law, the last strongman governor. And he's still a senator today. He's an old man. I talked to him. I actually come to class several times with Gerald Neal, who's a senator also. And uh, uh, Julian Carroll is a very charismatic man. He uh, entertained my, my questions about how come there's a low response to the, uh, the, uh, the representatives, to the people. Um, you know, he wanted to work it out. He was like, let's figure this out. Why? How come, how come we're not actually representing the people? How come the people are not actually uh, uh, being represented by Kentucky's... Uh, state government by Steve Brashear state government so John Y. Brown and Julian Carroll and also Drew Thornton's schemes were hatched and fulfilled in places such as Las Vegas and Libya Colombia Costa Rica Beirut Honduras El Salvador Panama and Angola and these are a lot of countries that CIA agents are a part of Libya we just went to war with Gaddafi uh, like two month war with Libya Colombia is known for their cocaine runners Costa Rica, um, you know, these are all Latin American countries, Honduras, El Salvador, uh, and El Salvador, is, uh, I believe, is where they killed Oscar Romero, uh, the priest, the art, uh, not the bishop, I don't think he's a bishop, I think he's just a priest, but during mass, they shot uh, Oscar Romero during mass because he was standing up for the democratic movement against the police state, and so that's why that, that priest had got shot. Um... Panama and Angola. We intervened in Panama, so he's he's uh, he's in all these spots where uh, American ha American government has militarily intervened in order to uh, you know do whatever. So there's a military presence in all these countries. So if he was part of the federal government, he was able to move with impunity because of it. So. I wonder how many other deflectors there are since it's all secret, you know, since we don't know anything about the FBI, CIA, or any of them. Um, Ralph Ross was possibly the least surprised of anybody uh, at Drew's absurd death. And we're going to read more about Ralph Ross um, in a few more pages in The Kentucky Bluegrass by Sally Ditton.